verse 4 from chapter 2 of Hatha Yoga Pradipika. The vital air does not pass in the middle channel because the nadis are full of impurities. So how can the state of Yunmani arise and how can perfection or city come about? I don't know what Unmani is, so hopefully she gets into that. I don't either. We could look it up if she doesn't. Yeah. So the vital air does not pass in the middle channel because the nadis are full of impurities. So I guess she's saying it. it oops. What did I just do? Alexandra's joining. Good morning. Good morning. We're just. I don't know, can she hear me? Oh, she can't hear me yet. Okay. You, you mani in the backs, it says it's a state of samadhi, consciousness devoid of finite mind. It means no mind or without mind. But hopefully... Uh Alexandra, we're just starting on verse four from chapter two. So when she says this first sentence, the vital air does not pass in the middle channel because the nadis are full of impurities. She's saying, is she saying it doesn't pass in that Shishumana channel? Because like all of our rivers of blood and prana are just full of impurities that they only flow through the nadis, possibly. Let's see, let's see what she has to say. If our perception was finally attuned to the pranic body, we would see a light body in which there were thousands of fine wire-like structures conducting Shakti. These wire-like structures are the nadis. Nadi is a flow of energy. The Shiva Samhita says that although there are 3,500,000 nadis in the body, the Prapakacharasa Tantra says 300,000, and the Garuksha Satarka says 72,000. And I think that 72,000 is the one that Amanda and her tradition and the studio's tradition teaches. There are thousands upon thousands of nadis within the superstructure of the gross body, and they distribute consciousness and prana to every atom. However, as stated here, and in the Garandanda Samhita, when the nadis are full of impurities, vayu, vayu being the air, does not enter them. What are these impurities? They are waste and residue of sensuous living and desires. Just as excess fats accumulate around blood vessels and can eventually obstruct the flow of blood, similarly, on pranic level, also there is an accumul on a pranic level, also there is an accumulation of wastes. With the buildup of waste matter, the body's capacity to circulate energy lessens. The body becomes lethargic, the energy level decreases and activation of the chakras and higher brain functions is prevented. Supposing you have one liter plastic bottle and inside it some areas are coated with cement and you try to fill it with one liter of nitric acid, two things will happen. One, the full liter of nitric acid will not fit, and two, the plastic will melt. Similarly, if kundalini shakti is released when the nadis are blocked and weak, you will not be able to handle the experience. Therefore, the whole body and network of nadis have to be purified and the energy channels have to be made strong. The pranic body is the inter intermediate link between physical body and the mind. Therefore, it can be approached from either side. It is, however, easier to control and purify the pranic body through the physical body. By strengthening the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, 
Ida and Pingala nadis are directly affected. And by developing the central nervous system, Shashumana is activated. Therefore, the most important practices of Hatha yoga are those which arouse the central nervous system and Shashumana. Verse five, when all the nadis and chakras which are full of impurities are purified, then the yogi is able to retain prana. I'm gonna start sharing my screen because there's a muted myself. Here is the picture of the chakras. In the process of awakening Kundalini, the Sadhaka not, has not only to clear the nadis, energy channels, but also increase the quantity and quality of prana and store it. Prana is accumulated in six main centers along the spinal column. These centers are located in the subtle body and cor correspond with the nerve plexuses in the body, in the physical body. In the subtle body, they are known as chakras. Chakra means a circling motion or wheel. Prana shakti and manas shakti collect in the chakras and form swirling masses of energy. Each chakra is a conjunction point for many nadis. There are numerous chakras in the body, but the seven major ones situated along Shashumana Nadi are specifically concerned with human evolution. In deep meditation, the yogis have seen these chakras and they describe them as lotus flowers. Though the chakras are situated in the subtle body, their influence extends to the gross and casual bodies. Each chakra vibrates at a particular rate and velocity. The chakras at the lowest point of the energy circuit operate on, the lower, on a lower frequency and are said to be grosser and to create grosser states of awareness. Whenever I hear that word gross, I, I just don't understand how, they, how we can't have this word. But I always translate it in my head as whole. So, the chakras at the lowest point of the energy circuit operate on a lower frequency and are said to be wholer and to create wholer states of awareness. That's how I read it in my head when I read those that word. Uh, it doesn't, no, that doesn't translate. To <laughs> I don't know, that word grosser makes me feel weird. I know it does. I'm always <laughs> like translating it when I'm talking, right? It's like denser, denser is a good. Denser, okay, denser. Chakras be, the, the, when you say denser, do you mean more grounded or it's iron like fillings more, as opposed to a gas? It's more physical. It's like um you a brain wave is very subtle and light, but a rock is very gross. Okay. And like and uh you see, I'm thinking in terms of physics, right? It's like, um, yeah, okay. denser. What's well, another? It's a rough line, right? I guess that's why the word gross is there. <laughs> it's, yeah, maybe um, you just have to study, or I just have to study the word gross. But anytime I hear that word, I'm like, what is this meaning? What is the meaning? It's like a ghost is very subtle, <laughs> but a physical body is gross. A physical so body is be like if the chakra, if the chakras were all like seven of the same size, like round ball, but maybe the ones toward the left were like not hollow, and then the ones toward the right were more hollow. Like, is it? It's the ones towards the bottom are more. Um, yeah, toward the bottom. I was saying left and right. Yeah, like they're more. It's not, I don't know how to describe it. It's like, like sometimes it's, it's translated with music because each one is related to a frequency of megahertz. So the lower chakras are a lower frequency, like a lower sound. 
which vibrates slower. That's why it makes a lower sound. And then as you move up the chakras, the frequency rises. So the sound gets higher and higher and higher. Like each chakra is, um, has a bija mantra, it has a note. So when you, you can listen to binaural beats and it, it'll tune, they say, your chakra because it's like the same frequency. So as you move up towards the crown, it's like the frequency is so high. It's like a radio wave is such a subtle high frequency that our bodies can't even perceive it, that we need a special machine to perceive it because it's so subtle. Yeah. But the frequency of a rock is, <laughs> is very easy to perceive. It's like dense. It's like my body is very easy to perceive because it's so um, dense and thick. <laughs> but, but the chakra is not easy to see because it's so subtle. It's so... Um, so like if you're if you're in the base chakras at the bottom, it's more involved with like the bottom is uh, food, shelter, the next one is sex, the next one is power. And if you think about our culture, yes. most people are kind of like in those chakras. And then when you start getting up to the heart chakra, which is love and universal compassion, then you start feeling a sort of lighter energy, right? It's a lot lighter than the, the power take, um, succeed, uh, have sex conquer, get the food, right? That's like very basic um, needs. Like you're starting to get up into the higher frequencies and then the throat is universal truth and the third eye has to do with like universal consciousness, same with the crown. So you're getting into like more and more mm -hmm. subtle things like if you look at the um elements are related to the chakras too the root has to do with earth and then um the next one up is water the next one up is fire if you think about like the density of those things the next one up is air and then you're getting into ether and then they say the top two are spirit so it's like from the densest of the the hardest or the heaviest heavy heaviest maybe that's a good word for <laughs> lightest <laughs> <laughs> okay all right let me get back here chakras at the top of the circuit operate on a high frequency and are responsible for subtle states of awareness and higher intelligence some yogic texts describe only five or six chakras other describe seven the lowest chakra is within the perennial floor in the male body and the cervix in the female body. It is a four petaled red lotus called muladhara and it influences the excretory and reproductive organs, reproductive glands and hormonal secretions. Muladhara is directly connected to the nose and sense of smell with our and with our animal instincts. At muladhara, human evolution begins and kundalini emerges. Two fingers with above muladhara and closely associated with it is Swadhis Swadhisthana chakra, a six-petaled vermilion lotus. It is connected to the sacral plexus, urinary and reproductive organs and glands. Swadhisthana is associated with the tongue and the sense of taste. It influences on the deeper personality around its influence on the deeper personality arouses a selfish sense of ego. The next chakra is behind the navel within the spinal column. It is a 10 petal yellow lotus called Manipura. It is associated with the solar plexus. Manipura influences the digestive process and the assimilation of food and prana. It is also connected to the eyes and sight. At the level of Manipura, the consciousness is still bound by the grosser levels of existence and sensualities, ambition and greed. Above Manipura is the proximity of the heart, its Anahata chakra, with 12 blue petals. It is connected to the cardiac plexus, heart, respiration, and thymus gland, and is responsible for emotions of love and hate, 
compassion and cruelty, etc. Anahata is also connected to the sense of touch and the hands. Within the middle of the throat is the fifth chakra, Vishuddhi, with 16 purple petals. It is associated with the cervical plexus and thyroid gland, and it maintains purity in the body and mind. Vishuddhi is connected to the ears and sense of audition, throat, and speech. It arouses acceptance of the adversities of life, mental balance, and, the, and sensitivity to the needs of others. At the top of the spinal column, at the mandula umbilicata, is the one of the most important chakras, Ajna chakra, which has two silvery gray or clear petals. Above Vishuddhi, the chakras are mainly concerned with higher intelligence. Some authorities do not even consider them as chakras because as the veiling powers of prana shakti decrease, decreases, manas shakti becomes more predominant. Aja chakra is the command center. It operates in conjunction with the reticular activity activating system, mandula umbilicata, and the pineal gland. Aja chakra is the third eye through which the whole subtle world can be perceived. It is known as the gateway to liberation. When Kundalini Shakti passes beyond Ajna, duality and ego ceases to exist. It reaches the highest center, Saharsh, Sahasra, oh goodness, I'm butchering this, Sahasrara, the thousand petal lotus. Sahasrara is situated in the crown of the head and is associated with the pituitary gland. When this chakra is fully activated by Kundalini, it is the highest experience of human evolution. Between Ajna and Sahasrara, there are three other chakras which are briefly mentioned in the tantras. Opposite, opposite the uvula is Lana chakra, which is a 12 petaled lotus. Above Ajna is Mana chakra, a six petaled lo lotus. And above that, at the mid cerebrum, is some chakra of 16 petals. These chakras are concerned with the flow of nectar, nectar from Bindu Visar, Visarga, which is discussed later. And they are responsible for higher states of consciousness and intelligence. Though Hatha Yoga through Hatha Yoga, all these chakras are influenced and stimulated and blockages are removed. The influence of each chakra can be felt in the body and seen in a person's behavior. Correct balance of energy in each of the chakras is extremely important. Dr. Hiroshi Motoyama of Japan has devised instruments which can detect the energy of these chakras and has found that depletion of energy and the paranormal functioning of any of these chakras causes imbalance or disease in the associated physical organs and body functions. This is exactly what is stated in the Hatha Yoga text. Purification of the chakras and nadis is the first step to physical and mental health and the awakening of Kundalini. Therefore, the chakras and nadis have to be strengthened, so they are capable of conducting the kundalini shakti. I'll pause there if anyone has any. Yeah, there is a lot in here in this one little section. That, um, I just feel like there's a lot to absorb here. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I've, I've been fascinated by the chakras for about the last four and a half years because at, when I got sick and I couldn't do, uh, well, I was told by this one doctor that I had to stop doing yoga for a while. Um, and so a yoga teacher gave me a meditation to do and, and it was a chakra meditation. So, you know, worked up from uh, 
basically bat him to tap. And it was uh, a really great meditation. It started with medita or meditating or chanting, you know, each of the sounds of, of each of the chakras. And then when you reach the top, you just went into silent meditation for 20 minutes or so. Um, and it was very illuminating, even though I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Um, but it was really illuminating. So this is, and I never really got it into any kind of order in my head. So this is very clarifying. Although what's interesting is, is the, the additional, the additional chakras at the end that, that she discusses. And also she didn't, did she even mention the, the Bindu chakra? I think she says she's going to get into it. Um, Is that the one she's going to get into? Yeah. Okay. So, the so what, what I didn't realize at all was the, the pictorial representations, you know, have, uh, have what looks like heavy duty symbolic meaning. And I thought, for example, that, uh, that Manipura had a more elevated, um, elevated, I don't know if purpose or intention is the right word, than she describes here. You know, I, you know, I, w I tended to think of that as a place with, you know, a chakra you could meditate and and helped develop I don't know, power or strength. I mean, I know the mulaharda is is also also that, but so this this makes it sound very much more concrete. I don't, I'm not being very articulate. Didn't get a lot of sleep last night, so the brain is still kicking in. <laughs> I feel very spacey today too. I don't know if it's because I just come off a work call, but even while I was reading, I felt like I was having, I was like watching myself read. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, it was, it was very spacey. I don't, I feel like, I mean, I don't know if you guys have taken Amanda's annual New Year's workshop. Yeah. 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 And so she talks about. Yes the chakras and how you can set intentions for each one. It's I've done it for three years in a row and I absolutely love it. I've had me, and I don't even know if I've ever told her this. And I know she's listening. I'm, I feel like I'm speaking about her and she's not here, but I've had major, a major life shift because of the power of those workshops and the uh, chakra. I mean, you can see, I, I also love the chakras. I, I stare mm -hmm. at them every day. I'm not an expert in them, but I do feel like there's power behind them, whether they're low or high. And I hear what you're saying, Sue, but I'm almost wondering now that you're saying like you thought like this, the solar plex Manipura area had this strength. Fire, behind. you know, what? fire out, fire power or something. Yeah, like that. which that's exactly what that area is. And right. that I focus a lot there. I mean, I do a lot of planking and core work. That's where that that fire is for me. Yeah. But Amanda was saying that those bottom levels are our first, second, and third chakra is where we focus, like where we dwell on as Americans. And they do have power, but maybe that's where, maybe that's where like our false sense of like ego comes in that we think that the power is really down there when it's really, and it's so heavy down there. And so much lighter up here. So like once we stop, like we can still focus down there. There's still a lot of power down there, but maybe there's even more power and lightness up here. For some reason, when I was doing the chakra meditation thing fairly regularly, I, I tend, I started to think about it in terms of balance. And Pam, remember for September, your month, you, you had a, an intention, which was health for you. So I thought, well, I'm going to do a Pam thing for October and it's going to be balanced because I'm so out of balance now. And, and 
when I think about the chakras, I think about them in terms of balance, that one's not more important than the other, you know, and one leads to the other, but that you need, you need to devote time and energy to all seven in order to be in balance. Um, but in some ways, this almost sounds like you literally work your way up so that you can attain, you know, basically attain the crown chakra so that you can, so that you can successfully meditate on the crown chakra. And that, you know, if, you know, in my beginner's mind, not only do you work your way up, but for those, you know, who, who believe this, that it is the crown chakra that doesn't disappear when your body dies. It is the crown chakra that's, that, that stays. Well, all the chakras come with you. It's a part of the um, energy body. So they come with you into the next life. It's like um, whatever imbalances you have in your energy body, you drag into your next body and it mm -hmm. forms the physicality of the next body. So whatever we're do work we're doing energetically, will get carried with us and give us a better body essentially in your next life. And just to speak to what you guys are saying, the, the, so something I read recently, um, one of my teachers who I've been studying with for, oh my God, it must be like 15 years now. He, um, he just came out with a new thing um, called Antar Yoga, which is the um, like, more advanced. I think I told you guys this. I'm like dorking out on it, <laughs> reading. And he said that it's actually very advanced work to just focus on any of the chakras lower than the third eye, as you're starting off with that. Um, for a beginner working with chakras, you should focus on the third eye on Ajna because it's the controller of the rest of the chakras. And like, if you, if you read the yoga sutras, they talk about the um, cities or psychic powers you get from certain samadhis or um, like deep meditations. And some of them, they're directing you to certain parts of the body. Like if you do samyama or um, like full absorption practices on the navel solar plexus, you start to remember all your past lives. Like you get that psychic power, right? So I always thought what well, you thought, so until I started reading these more advanced descriptions of it, and he's saying that everyone should start with the third eye. And each one gives you, they're all powerful and each give you different kinds of powers, like the root and the, um, you know, the, the lower three give you a lot of physical power material power it's just that the material is manifested arranged and formed from the spiritual so so pam's so what pam's saying is right and what you're saying is right it's very complicated <laughs> and i wanted to bring up um if you got i can't remember what it's called where they pass um frequencies through a speaker into sand and the sand forms into mm -hmm. shape. Do you guys know about that? When yeah. they do the frequencies of the chakras, they form into the symbol of them. So when you were saying that like each chakra's symbol has meaning, it's literally the picture of the vibration in the material. Is that not so cool? That's really cool. The that thing is you did that back then? It blows my mind. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Amanda? Yeah. When you say it's liter literally the picture, can you expand on that? I can, I can see if I can pull can it up. Pull again. that um, chakra picture back up. Yeah. Hold on, my computer's about to die. Oh. Ooh. Technology. So those shapes mm -hmm. you see it? come up in the sand. 
when they pass the sound of the mantra, the frequency of the mantra through it. And like I had been looking at those shapes for years and years and years and years. And when I saw that experiment, I was like, shut <laughs> I I think we learned this, or I don't know if you were on one day, Amanda, but there was something, I can't remember exactly what it was, but there was something in this book and I was like, literally every piece of yoga matters. There's nothing in yoga that doesn't have so much background knowledge behind it. The way you put your fingers, the way you breathe, the way you put your body, the way you think, the way you treat yourself internally and externally. I mean, it is just, even this, like what you're saying now, like there, it, it's not just a pretty symbol, like so that I will buy this tapestry and hang it on my wall because it looks pretty. Like there is so much science and knowledge behind it. Like what blows my mind though is these shapes arrived to them as visions, the sages and the rishis in meditation. So this whole idea of gaining knowledge from these practices, you know, in the beginning when you're learning, it seems pretty ridiculous. I remember the first time I read the yoga sutras and they're like, oh, you focus on this part of your body and do some yama, you gain, um, or if you do some yama on the North Star, you gain all knowledge of all the planetary systems. I was like, what? <laughs> but then the more you start learning all this stuff, it's like, well, actually maybe that's a possibility. Like if you understand the way you start to more deeply understand the way that matter is arranged and the way consciousness informs matter. If you tap into the consciousness, you gain knowledge of the matter. That kind of maybe, I don't know, the more I, <laughs> maybe anything is possible. You know, I was like very, very hypercritical when I first started down this rabbit hole. And the more I like get into it, it's, the more I start to believe this stuff could be potentially true because when you start meditating a lot, you start getting information and you don't know how it's coming to you, but you start gaining knowledge of things that it doesn't make any sense that you would know. You know what I mean? Have you yeah. guys experienced that? I feel like I experienced it opposite. Like yesterday during meditation, um, Kramer woke up. So I, I, my meditation was walking him while you guys were meditating. And so I didn't sit and meditate like I, I traditionally do. And sometimes I just tell myself, this is what I'm meant to do. Like, this is my meditation today, walking Kramer. And, but I kind of felt like off all day. So it's not like that I'm looking for information. It's just that I don't feel as clear when I don't do it mm -hmm. on a work day. See, it's not as hard. It's not as noticeable for me on the weekends because I already feel a lot calmer, but I felt like my work day was a little off just because I didn't sit for the 20 minutes. Yeah, it makes a huge difference. Yeah. But I, I did, I was like, and I could have came home and done it and did it. And sometimes I tell myself I will, and sometimes I do it, I do it. But I, I, I try not to force it. I kind of just, I can't, exp it's not like a force. It's just like, it's almost nice when you skip it right? And you change things because then you notice. That's when I notice things. Yeah. But it's not consistently the same. So when I meditate, I don't, um, I don't think I get exi what, what you're describing, Amanda, but I wouldn't expect to either given where I'm at and so on. But if, if my mind isn't, if my meditation isn't too fraught with coming back to the center, you know, too many times, and if I can get further into it, I definitely come out of it with literally almost creative visions and feeling much lighter at the same time being more grounded. But the other, one other thing I want to say about the chakras that struck me is that when I was first looking at the chakras, there are colors associated with each chakra and all of a sudden it, it dawned on me that from bottom to top it's Roy G. Biv. Remember Roy G. Biv? <laughs> from, uh, I don't know, uh, fifth grade or something. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, But those colors each have specific wavelengths. They're light and they have specific wavelengths. 
And what is remarkable to me is that there are, those are the wavelengths of the colors of what we can see, not of what we can't see. Those are the wave, the colors that are attached to each chakra are, um, they're colors, so we can see them. And, and obviously there's, there's, there are other things out in the world that we can't see, you know, that, that you know, the, where the wavelengths are beyond our perception. And I, and I think that's relevant too, only I don't know how. <laughs> I can't think. I'm, At a certain I, point, you start seeing colors when you're meditating. It almost looks like a lava lamp in your mind's eye. I don't know if you guys have experienced yeah. that. Oh yeah, I, I get that. I get that. And it's, I used to be like, am I enlightened? You know, and I asked one of my teachers and they're like, no, you're just seeing the emanations of the chakras rising up. Right. Right. Well, yeah, all right. <laughs> right. I love doing chakra meditation. And I, you know, Nikki, um, Amanda, she's the one that, that introduced mm -hmm. me to it. And it was, it's one of my favorite meditations. It's one, it's pretty much how I got introduced to meditating. And before I was this calmer person, it was something I used to like, be like, Eric, I need, I need five minutes, leave me alone. And I would go and sit and do the, the Roy G. Biv up and down my spine. And I wasn't doing it as an, like, I was just doing it to just get myself to calm down my anxiety. Um, it wasn't like some sort of expert. I, I, know, I really had no idea what mm -hmm. I was doing. I, it just made me feel better. But I've also, with the yin training that, that teacher Karina taught us that there are different colors different people teach different colors to the chakras and i don't i haven't studied into that but that was interesting that was just one of those rugs pull out from underneath you like what yeah i didn't know that so some people say that they're not associated with any colors yeah that came from um this sort of spiritual person i think it was in the 60s who was like arriving at these realizations. So they wrote it down and then Ju Judith, oh, what is her, uh, there's a, she wrote a book about the chakras and she, she sort of perpetuated the idea that each one has a color, mm -hmm. but I believe they have colors. Is that the Eastern body, Western mind book? No, I think it's something real, something she might've wrote. I think she wrote that other books too. Yeah, I know Anna Dea Judith. Eastern yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So I have that book here waiting to be read, but it's gonna that's gonna be like uh Sue, if you're interested in chakras, that's a book Renata recommended to me on chakras. I can what is the name of it again? Eastern Body, Western Mind. Okay. So we should move into breath and meditation. I feel like we could talk about chakras all day today. I wish I could just take the day off and just study them. Okay, so we'll set up. Uh, wheel of Life. Oh, Wheel of Life. By the same author. No, that's not it. Hold on. <laughs> Wheels of Life, same author, Anna Dia Judith. Yeah, I don't know if she's the one who was from the 60s, though. Anyway. Yeah, I have it somewhere in the yin training notebook somewhere. I obviously was like, okay, I, I hear what you're saying, but right now I don't care. That was too much information for me. <laughs> I'm like, st I want to stick with my rainbow colors. Okay. <laughs> with the two Pam <laughs> okay so setting up for alternate nostril breathing finding a, a straight spine whether you're laying down or sitting up just taking a few rounds of nostril breathing just setting into your breath And then bringing right hand over to your nose. Close your right nostril with your right thumb. Inhale through your left. Close left with your right ring finger. Exhale right. Inhale right. 
close right, exhale left. Inhale left. Close left, exhale right. Inhale right. Close right, exhale left. Inhale left. Close left, exhale right. Inhale right. Close right, exhale left. Inhale left. Close left, exhale right. Inhale right. Close right, exhale left. Taking five more rounds on your own breath. Adding that retention if it's in your practice. You'll take your time to finish. Then begin to settle into your meditation. I'll set the timer. Setting your intention for your meditation, possibly bringing your attention to your third eye today and bringing the gaze up to your third eye. Using that as a drishti. Using a mantra that you're working with, I am healthy, I am grateful or just silently repeating the word OM.
bringing hands to meet. Namaste. Namaste, everybody. Thank you so much. Have a beautiful day and weekend. Have a great weekend, everyone. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.